Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Lori Kerner. What is education? The answer to that question should be as unique as every child. Lori is a passionate public education and child advocate. As a mother of four, Lori has seen both personally and professionally the changes that have transpired within our American education system. With nearly 30 years in education, Lori has had the good fortune of teaching every elementary grade level and spent the first 26 years of her career as a general education teacher. Throughout her journey, she has served in several positions, including adjunct professor of special education, coordinator, and principal for a public school program for at-risk students, and is currently the principal of Tremont Elementary School in the Patchogue Medford School District. Through research, theory, and practice, Lori has seen firsthand the difference that is made when physical, emotional, academic, and social growth opportunities are offered to children in schools. Each of these areas is equally important and should be established as such with no one area superseding another. Lori is currently working on her doctorate in educational leadership and looks forward to sharing this whole child approach to education and to making a difference across our nation. In a system filled with uncertainty, and as a leader in education, Lori feels it is essential to maintain resiliency for what is in the best interest of all children. So hello, Lori Kerner. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Lily? I'm doing great. I love to see you. I love to see you, too. <laughs> we, we can hang out. You we can I. totally <laughs> hang out. I think we're going to be doing uh, that yes, later. Yes. So, Lori, it's been, let's see, we did our last interview December 2017, Master Leadership, episode ML83. 83. 83. So it's been a little bit. What's happened since then? Oh, my goodness. It seems like time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, so much has happened. We have implemented so many new initiatives in Patchogue Medford mm -hmm. and at Tremont, you know, in the last uh, six months or so. Mm -hmm. And one of them was with you. Tell us about it. <laughs> Our first Master Leadership Podcast for Schools was implemented, and one of our teachers was the advisor of that. We did it at Tremont and at Saxton Middle School. Huge success. The children loved the experience. They had the opportunity to learn about leadership, right, mm -hmm. through uh, John Maxwell's premise, right, mm -hmm. and to learn how to conduct a podcast, interview leaders, and they grew so much through that experience, and we're so excited to continue it again next year. Well, I'm excited as well. I got to meet the kids, and they were Aren't they fantastic. Great? I yes. know they're fantastic. And the questions that they asked me were wonderful. The, like the, one of the questions was, "How do you transition from one question to the next?" That's a good question because I was in there watching them when they did their podcast with Teresa Baldinucci. Mm -hmm. She uh, is one of our board trustees now, one of our vice presidents of the Board of Education here in Patchogue Midford. So we were so grateful to her for her time. But they kept shutting the microphone in between each question. So I think it's interesting that they really learned from that experience and asked you valid questions um, because of their interest in learning more about how to conduct um, a proper podcast interview. Right. So. And the framework is to teach leadership skills to teachers, and then they would teach leadership skills to the students. And so from your perspective, how do you think that went? I think it went quite well. The feedback that I received from Andrea Methvin, who mm -hmm. was our advisor for the club, was that she learned so much, not only from you, through your quality training. She learned so much through those experiences, but also from the children. Yes. She said they taught her so much about herself, her practice, her mindset. So it was really a reciprocal experience. And Quite honestly, I mean, I think every school would benefit from that type of opportunity. Thank you for the plug. You're welcome. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, listen, it's not a plug. It's the truth. You know me now, right. and you know that I'm passionate about what I believe is in the best interests of 
the children. And the children that were involved in that club came from different places academically, socially, and emotionally. And they came together. And it's essential that we offer them those opportunities to work together and to tap into their own interests and passions to learn more about themselves. Yeah. I'm so excited for next year. Yeah. One of my fundamental beliefs is that this will prepare them for any future that they encounter. It's public speaking, pragmatic language, uh, socialization, research, because they had to research what does a board of education member do, what are their responsibilities. So it was multifaceted. Awesome. Yeah. So last we spoke, I asked about your leadership journey. We'll kind of shift a little bit and talk (laughs) about what you've been doing and what's your vision for yourself as a leader. What do you plan? (laughs) (laughs) Well, when you walked into my office, we had a small discussion about how deeply embedded I am in my dissertation research work right now, Mm -hmm. uh, which is based on our vision and mission here in Petrock Medford, probably why I am here. But um, my research is based on teachers' perceptions of the impact of recess on children's social and emotional development and their attention to sustained learning. So I think about it (laughs) every second of every day. And, you know, I watch and I listen and I learn from the teachers and the children about their thoughts on what we're implementing here and how it's affecting them through their journey. So it's it's been fantastic. I've read so many amazing books. I see you post. I do because everything I read is so powerful and it resonates with me and I want to share it with the world because I think it's important for all leaders, teachers, parents, community members to have access to those books and materials so that they can better understand the rationale behind what we're doing here so emphatically. Mm -hmm. And so you're focusing on recess. Why is recess so important? Oh, that's a loaded question. Recess (laughs) offers people. Think about this, not just children, right? Recess breaks, because what is recess? It's a period of a break from your focus time. Um, But let's talk about the children. Mm -hmm. Recess offers children time to socialize, interact, collaborate, communicate, problem solve on their own, right, without adult intervention. And we tell children what to do all day long. Mm -hmm. Uh, We give them that structured environment that they do thrive in. However, they really do need that downtime so that they can explore the world around them and each other. Mm -hmm. So through the recess, we have seen here an increase and a strengthening in our students, social skills, social competencies, emotional well-being, you know, just having that time to understand and reflect on themselves and who they are as people and who they like and who they want to be with and what they choose to do. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a, a huge increase in those types of skills. But it also gives them a chance to come back into the classroom and be ready to focus on that sustained instruction. So we have had a huge increase increase in our literacy progress here at Tremont um, in the last year, which is so exciting for us. So you've increased recess from what to? So we, uh, the last two years, we've had 40 minutes of recess. So what we did at Tremont towards the middle of last year was we noticed that the children were becoming fidgety um, in their 40-minute lunch period. So we did a little bit of a study and watched them, and then um, I collaborated with our cafeteria staff and they agreed that the children would become fidgety after 30 minutes. They had all finished their lunches, the majority of them. And so what we decided to do was to cut lunch to 30 minutes and take that extra 10 minutes and add it on to the recess time. So now the children here at Tremont have 50 minutes of recess with the 30-minute lunch, and the teachers are giving them those brain breaks throughout the school day in between sustained instruction. And so we actually had a great meeting at the end of the year, the entire staff and I, and it was a Socratic circle, Mm -hmm. and we had a conversation, you know, what did you see, what did you find, and it was really eye-opening. So the staff feels very confident about Mm -hmm. our new approach. I love it. I I know, I'm I'm jumping up and down as I'm speaking to you. I see, you're so excited. Um, (laughs) But you tapped into something that I have decided to practice because I needed it, but it was so counterintuitive for me, brain breaks. Mm -hmm. For someone like me who can get Mm hyper-focused, talk to me about how important brain breaks are. 
I'm a hyper-focused person, too. I think most people who know me would just say that I'm hyper. (laughs) You know, because the passion. But the brain breaks are essential. The research is incredible. We need that time off to recharge and re-energize and almost to focus somewhere else so that when we come back to our task at hand, we're fresh and we're ready and we're open to learning more or digging deeper into that sustained task or whatever it is that we're hyper-focused on. Mm -hmm. There's just so much incredible research that I've stumbled upon, and so I'll read it, and then I'll chat with the staff and ask them their opinions and if they're willing to attempt some of these theories into their practice, and when they do, the results are really incredible for the children, and it's about the children. Um, Like you had mentioned, we want our staff to follow on with this as well. Our teachers need brain breaks. You know, our cafeteria staff, our secretarial staff, our custodial, everyone needs a break. And so when we treat each other with that respect, that downtime, we get more in the productivity of everyone involved. So. How do you practice brain breaks? And there's probably a ton of people listening that are laughing right now because uh, I'm a go-go girl. But um, I wake up early in the morning. I go for a run or a walk or I go to the gym and I take that reflective time for myself. But during the day, I do force myself to go for a walk around the building or outside or chat with staff and and pull myself away from my sustained work. Most of the days during school time, I'm with the kids anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's more for me at night when I'm working on something that requires my full attention. I put a timer on my phone and make sure that I... High five. High five. Well, you have to because if I didn't... In the past, before I started the mindfulness and that real practice that I preach, it would be three, four hours later, you know, and your eyes are tired and your your head is spinning. And you get depressed. And you get confused. And sometimes when I would do that, and then I would go back to my work the next day and reread or reevaluate, what was I thinking? It's too much. Mm -hmm. So if it's too much for us as adults, we really need to keep in mind the children. Um, There's a cognitive immaturity theory and a surplus energy theory and a novelty theory, and they all say the same thing. We get fidgety. You know, we we stop focusing. Even if we think we're focusing, we're not really after a certain period of time. So, Right, and for people who are high-achieving and hyper-focused, we think that if we take a break, it'll throw our thinking off. And it's so counterintuitive because I had to do this, Lori. I used to hyper-focus, and by the end of the day, I was just You're depleted. exhausted. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. depleted in every way. But think about children, and that's where the whole homework debate comes in, and I'm not sure that we'll be <laughs> getting into that today, but the reality is we have them here for six hours. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure when they go home they have opportunities outside of that sustained work. So, you know, we need to redefine what homework is is and what it looks like. Right. The other thing is you said that you force yourself to pull away. I have to do that. I have this app on my phone called Tide, T-I-D-E. They um, implement the Pomodoro technique where you have sustained work for 25 minutes and then you take a break. Mm -hmm. But what I was doing is I was walking my dog for 10 minutes. So then (laughs) I had to get her out of that habit because every Uh, 25 minutes she wanted to walk. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. But I had to force myself. So when you said that, Mm -hmm. it clicked. Sometimes I think the perception of teachers or leaders is, well, if we offer children breaks 15 minutes on every hour or whatever the case, that's Finland's model. Mm -hmm. And and I do look uh, to that model I have for many, many many years um, because they are leaders in education. But some of the perceptions are that if we interrupt children for 15 minutes on every hour, then it will break their concentration. But the reality is that it it really doesn't. It's a benefit. So what I do for myself is I'll, I'll make a list before I leave my task on what I want to continue once I uh, come back to it. And I, I think that's how we have to work with the children as well. You know? I love that. So, love that. Yeah. so I'm assuming that you may have gotten pushback. As a leader, how do you deal with pushback? 
It's a good question. I have to say, though, we really didn't get pushback with the recess. This community is exceptionally supportive. Mm -hmm. I think we spoke about that last time. And our Board of Education is exceptionally supportive. So we're very fortunate here. And I think it is in the presentation of whatever it is that you are looking to implement. You know, if you present it in a positive way with the benefits and the rationale, it generally goes over well. And as long as the community and the parents know that you really do look after the best interests of the children, they tend to trust you. Right. And I think that now I've been here, this is my third year coming up. Mm -hmm. I think the community here at Tremont has gotten to know me. I would hope that they have. I'm pretty transparent. And so when they know that you're looking after their child's best interest, there really hasn't been a pushback for the recess. But dealing with pushback, generally speaking, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Because, you know, we don't want to paint this glorified, everything's perfect picture. But it's not always. There will be different perceptions and different mm -hmm. ideas. And for me, what I like to do is ask questions. You know, why do you feel that way? Can you share with me your fears or your anxieties or your lens? And I think in having those honest, open conversations, we can better understand each other and then work with a compromise. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Or just understand each other, and then maybe there's clarity. I love that because what you're doing, that's valuing the people that you lead. But you do have to value the people that you lead. I don't even like to use that term, you know, that you lead. I feel like I always like to use the term that I work alongside because I feel like we're a team. Mm -hmm. And even though I am the leader of the school, we need each other. I love your integrity, your compassion, your passion. I wish the listeners could see it. It shines through your eyes and your Thank smile, you. and you're Thank so you. excited I'm about I'm so lucky leadership. to be able to do what I do. Awesome. I, I really I have gratitude every day, every morning when I wake up. You know, mm -hmm. so much gratitude for this opportunity right now here in Patrick Medford, honestly. Awesome, so. awesome. Now, I want to touch on something that is very close to, I guess, the hearts of teachers, educators, and the hearts of parents as well. The use of technology and how it's so different now. Our kids, our students are socializing mm -hmm. on technology. And that used to make me so fearful. But I've had conversations with many people. And most of the people, most of the relationships that I'm building now recently has been on social media. So it's kind of shifted me a little bit. The question is, how can we best influence our students, our children, to use social media responsibly? You hit a nerve. Because as soon as you started speaking about technology and social media, my instant feeling was, I hate it. When I think of my own children um, and their constant it's almost like an addiction, right? To have to, where's the phone? Or to be on the video game, chatting with someone now. It's a compulsion in our society. On the flip side, in a sense, it's the wave of the future, right? So we do have to find that happy medium and that compromise. During the school day here, we don't allow children to bring any technological devices because our core values are centered around socialization mm -hmm. and getting along with others. So that's one way that we... Um, assist here, I mm -hmm. think. But social media can be a benefit. And you know, as well as I do, I use social media very frequently, but properly. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to start teaching children at a very young age the responsibilities behind the technological opportunities or the responsibility to have those devices. What's appropriate? What's a danger? You know, netiquette and the etiquette of technology we also need to make sure that we differentiate between text messaging and real life writing skills. Because for me as an educator, I'm seeing these blurred lines now where children's writing skills are looking like text messages, right? So a lot of those abbreviations that we use are coming out in their written expressive language. And for me, that's a danger. Mm -hmm. So here at Tremont, one of our goals for next year is to raise the bar with the writing and focus on that differentiation. Wonderful. Yeah. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Want to learn more about Master Leadership at Schools podcast program and see it in action? 
Go to masterleadership.org forward slash MLS and find out how your organization can prepare students well for any future they encounter. Request more information and get a complimentary copy of the Master Leadership Journal, which can also prime you to be a guest on our podcast. That's masterleadership.org forward slash MLS. Hi, Lori. <laughs> we're back. So we're back. We're taking breaks in between. The we s- need those brain breaks. <laughs> well, really, because the air conditioning. <laughs> it got hot in here very fast. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to share that I shifted as far as social media. I had a deep fear of my son, who's a teenager, mm-hmm. meeting people on social media, mm-hmm. you know. And stranger danger. Yeah, stranger, all that stuff. It's funny because we did have that conversation about meeting people on social media and treading lightly and knowing who to speak to. And that's actually how Mike Hines and I met in person. We were both professors at Dowling at the same time, but parallel. So we had not interacted. And I reached out to him via social media. I had been speaking across Long Island about Common Core and APPR and the realities of our system, and he had been as well. So I had reached out to him through social media so that we could kind of um, put our forces together. So I think it's funny that we have these fears, yet it could be a benefit if it's done correctly. And that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I was meeting people, wonderful people on social media, that if I had this fear... I would never have met. And then it didn't parallel with what I was teaching my son or the fear I had about him. And so it shifted in that now I look at how to teach him to use social media responsibly to lead himself well so that he can connect with awesome people. Mm -hmm. I think that you hit on a really important point there in that we need to teach children at a very young age how to be in touch with themselves as leaders right through like the podcast program that we're doing here and that's why there's such a connection there because they learn to lead themselves well and it's a process and then they practice it with social media they do and so that plus the yoga and the mindfulness which is the Mm self-regulation right and taking that time to pause and think before you act these are all really important skills for young children to develop Mm -hmm. that's absolutely right now i hear that you have someone who's one of my crushes. One of mine, too. <laughs> coming to Pet Talk we Medford. We do. We do. So we've had a lot of very wonderful opportunities. And we talk about leadership. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that it was due to the leadership of my kinds and the support of our board, right? So this year, we've had Dr. Peter Gray here working with us on our play clubs. He's a well-known psychologist from Boston College. His books are phenomenal. I highly recommend them. We've collaborated with John Moreau, author of Addicted to Reform. We have been collaborating with Sir Ken Robinson, our crush, and he will be joining us in Pat Med on November 15th for a community forum. And if you have not seen his TED Talk, uh, you should. I highly, highly recommend it. Do schools kill creativity? He's an author. He's an educational leader. He consults with educational systems around the world. And his vision is powerful and innovative, and that's exactly what we want. And I believe we're implementing here in Pet Med. So, awesome. so and he's coming in November. November 15th. We have so, a seat for you, Lily. We have you a seat. Know, that was my we next do. Question. We have a seat for you. <laughs> you can sit right next air, to me. <laughs> can I sit next to? <laughs> we're excited for the community. We really are. Um, You know, I wrote down something that came up for me, that Patchogue Medford is a leadership and innovation incubator. I like that. I, I love that. I love that. We do take pride in the fact that we are definitely... 100% shifting our paradigm here to meet the needs of education for the future, right? We can't continue in a system that's antiquated. It's not working. You know, the research shows that uh, since Common Core, APPR, Race to the Top, No Child Left Behind, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. There's more stress. Well, except for the fact that childhood anxiety is at an all-time high, teacher morale is at an all-time low. I mean, that's all negative. Nothing positive has come out of those initiatives. So we have had in-depth discussions. What are we going to do? And we need, if we're going to have that title 
of leader, then we need to lead. And we need to lead by example. And we need to lead in the best interest of the teachers and the children. Lori, as an educator, and I know I'm not the only one that thought this, there's the possibility that we could be teaching the next leaders, the next president of the U.S. I mean, we are. Right. We are. So, but here's my question, then why is it that we don't teach leadership skills across the board? If we think that, if we really believe that, then how important is it to teach leadership skills? It's exceptionally important, and I think through our collaboration with you and with all of the people that I had mentioned earlier. We're reinventing our curriculum. We're reinventing our core values here. And through the programs and initiatives, we are beginning to teach the children those skills for leadership. An example is the recess. You know, how Mm -hmm. do you learn to lead? How do you learn through our play clubs? You learn to lead by interacting with others and knowing how to problem solve and communicate your feelings and understand empathy and compassion. These are all the underpinnings, I believe, of learning how to be a leader. And there are some children who will choose not to lead. And for me, the goal for them is to know who to follow. Well, you know, in order to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, we have to lead ourselves. Ourselves. At least know how to lead yourself. That's teaching children good decision-making skills, Mm -hmm. right? And being secure enough in their own selves that they can uh, make those choices of what they choose to do and what path they are seeking. So I agree with you. So now I'm melting. It's hot. (laughs) We had to shut the air conditioner because it was too loud. Did you want to talk about anything else? Anything else you want to share with our listeners? I'm so excited to have you back here at Tremont. I'm I'm excited for our collaboration uh, through the next uh, school year and beyond. You know, just looking forward to some of the new things that will be happening in Pat Med next year that I will share the next time that we speak. <laughs> and so next time you'll be Dr. Lori. No, no. Turner. Oh, if only. I have one more year um, and then uh, solidify the results of the research and defend the dissertation. Well, um, congratulations. But thank you. I, mean, that, I know that <laughs> takes a lot of perseverance. And, and brain breaks. And brain And brain <laughs> breaks. <laughs> I love you. (laughs) Thank you. I love you, too. All right. So thank you so much, Lori. Thanks for Um, the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. We just have such a connection. Thanks, Lily. Bye. Bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.